Good afternoon. We begin this afternoon's business with portfolio questions. Question number one from Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what importance it gives to nursing roles in general practice. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robertson. General practice nurses are essential to the future of primary care and general practice services. That's why the Scottish Government has committed to investing £2 million for additional training to enhance their skills so that they are better equipped to meet the needs of patients with multiple health conditions, making it easier for patients to access the right person at the right time. Linda Fabiani. I'm pleased to hear that um, the Scottish Government wants an enhanced role for nurses in general practice. But can I ask how the Cabinet Secretary intends to make sure that health boards and indeed GP practices take this on board and recognise the worth of practice nurses? Cabinet Secretary. Well, certainly general practice nurses are essential to the future of general practice, in particular the new model of multidisciplinary team working. Um, we are very confident that through the, the new model and obviously the, the contract negotiations that are ongoing are, are key to the delivery of that, we'll very much recognise the role of the, the general practice nurse. Uh, the finance, the £2 million that I mentioned in my first answer that are that's being invested for additional training uh, is going to make sure that uh, general practice nurses can uh, contribute uh, even more than they do already and they contribute a lot to general practice settings and primary care more generally but of course it will also uh, free up time for doctors to spend with those patients who need their skill set uh, and uh, will make sure that the, the patient is seeing the right person within the practice. Um, what I can also say to Linda Fabiani is that a short life working group has commenced, uh, instigated jointly by the primary care directorate and the chief uh, nursing officer directorate to refresh the role and educational requirements of general practice nurses. But I'm confident that they will continue to play uh, an even more enhanced role than they do at the moment within general practice settings. Donald Cameron. The Cabinet Secretary mentioned the additional investment to upskill general practice staff, such as practice nurses, which we welcome. But what is the government's response to the Royal College of GPs call yesterday that the £500 million promised to GPs and health centres by the First Minister last October could be, and I quote, clearly outlined for the GP service rather than primary care in general, so that all those who work in general practice, including practice nurses, can benefit? Cabinet Secretary. Well, we've been clear that there will be £500 million uh, more uh, going to primary care uh, by 2020-2021. Uh, uh, and within that, £250 million will go uh, directly to uh, general practice. That has been uh, discussed uh, with the, the, the BMA and indeed I've had meetings with the RCGP uh, to discuss uh, this as well. Uh, what's important and everybody recognises, particularly the BMA recognise in the negotiations uh, around the new contract, is that in order to meet the needs of the population going forward, uh, that can't all be put on the shoulders of GPs. It has to be a multidisciplinary team. And in recognising that, the resourcing, uh, the 500 million, will recognise that uh, as well as general practice uh, nurses, we would need uh, community-based paramedics, we need AHPs, we need pharmacists, all of whom will uh, form that multidisciplinary team as well as mental health workers uh, and others. Uh, I would hope that there would be very few, if any, uh, within this chamber who would disagree with that principle. The resource is a big shift of resource uh, towards primary care. I thought that would be something that would be welcomed across this chamber. Anna Sarwar. I, I do welcome the new investment going into primary care and also welcome what the Cabinet Secretary said about nursing roles in primary care, particularly as we head towards being 830 GPs short in primary care by 2020. Two key elements to make that work, though, will be one, the GP contract, and secondly, the workforce plan. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary what role other healthcare professionals will have in the GP contract process, and secondly, when she will be publishing a detailed workforce plan? 
Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, the, the workforce plan uh, is on schedule to be published, uh, as I said, in uh, late spring, so imminently in the next few weeks. Uh, and of course, that has been a, a big undertaking with uh, mass, masses amounts of consultation across uh, many uh, sectors and uh, staffing groups. Um, the GP contract, uh, as Anna Sarwar will be aware, is a, a contract negotiated between uh, the Scottish Government and the, the British Medical Association. That is how the contract is negotiated. And uh, once that contract has been negotiated, obviously the, the details of that will be released, but it would be inappropriate while those negotiations are ongoing uh, for us to, uh, to do that until the negotiations are concluded. But once they are, I would be uh, to make sure that Parliament is informed of the outcome of that. Question number two, John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking in light of reports that 65% of adults in Scotland are either overweight or obese. Minister Eileen Campbell. Thank you. Uh, we remain committed to addressing Scotland's excess weight and in line with the evidence we are maintaining activity across the whole of society that makes it easier for people to be more active, to eat less and to eat better. For example, we've invested 12 million over five years to 2017 on a range of programmes to support and encourage healthy eating. This year, we're providing councils with a further 53.9 million of revenue funding for free school meals. We've also exceeded our target of delivering 150 community sports hubs across all local authorities by 2016. Sports Scotland has also announced a further 6 million investment to create a total of 200 hubs by 2020. John Scott. I thank the Minister for her answer and would ask her to consider the impact of price promotions on obesity as Cancer Research UK assert that 40% of all calories are bought on price promotions. Food and drink that are high in fat, sugar and salt content are seriously damaging the health of the people of Scotland in so many different ways. So can she tell us how she might address these concerns, particularly about very high calorie intake as a result of price promotions. Minister. Um, price promotion certainly is a, a th an issue that Cancer Research UK have uh, pointed out as an area of which we need to take action on and certainly there will be opportunity uh, to delve deeply into those issues and a whole range of other issues as we develop the cancer obesity, uh, sorry, the obesity strategy uh, and the consultation to go with that in the uh, imminent future. And we certainly will continue to engage with Cancer Research uh, UK on this. It's really helpful some of the evidence that they are compiling on this issue that allows us just to uh, identify how big an issue this is for Scotland to, uh, to deal with and the challenges that we face and certainly price promotion, the access, the affordability of high fat, uh, sugar and salt uh, foods is certainly one that we need to, to look at where there should be nothing off, off the table as we approach the, the, the new strategy and certainly I look forward to working with the member on the consultation as we bring it forward. Marie Todd. Siding officer. Tata. Can I ask uh, whether the Minister shares my disappointment that the UK Government didn't take the opportunity to introduce further restrictions on junk food advertising in their action plan on childhood obesity? Minister. Absolutely, I would uh, share the Member's uh, disappointment on the uh, UK Government's decision not to include restrictions on junk food advertising. Uh, and think that does align itself with the disappointment that Cancer Research UK expressed as well in, in relation to the points that John Scott raised. Um, we've long argued that a ban up to the 9pm watershed would, be, would greatly reduce children's exposure to the marketing of unhealthy foods. And that's not just my point of view. This is a measure that is backed up by recommendations from both Public Health England and Food Standards Scotland and also has the backing of the Welsh and Northern Irish governments and again has a huge amount of support across our third sector and again reiterate <coughs> the very strong arguments and lines of arguments that Cancer Research UK have taken on this issue. So again, we hope beyond the election that perhaps there will be a change of heart. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be aware that as well as two-thirds of adults being overweight or obese, almost a third of children in Scotland are. And does the Minister therefore recognise that, that the current prevention of obesity route map isn't working? And given, as we've already heard, the utterly inadequate child obesity strategy published recently by the UK Government is also failing, 
Will the Minister give a clear commitment that the new strategy will accept and recognise that the causes and consequences of obesity are not borne equally among Scotland's population and there is a disproportionate impact on those from deprived areas? And if we want to tackle this particular health inequality, we need to also tackle wealth inequality in Scotland. Minister. I absolutely recognise that there is a disproportionate impact felt on the communities that are the most vulnerable and absolutely they stand to gain the most if we uh, take collective and bold action on ta tackling the issues of obesity. That's why we're taking forward uh, and uh, bringing forward a new strategy, starting with the consultation that we'll be coming forward with uh, very soon. We'll take on board all the issues that have been raised, not just by the member who's taken a keen interest and is continually raising those issues, but members across the chamber, also our partners, our third sector organisations, to make sure that we get this right. We have a challenge here that we need to face. It costs our NHS and public purse uh, money, but it's also costing uh, costly in terms of the impact it has on people's, on people's lives. Those most impacted on are, again, as Colin Smith articulates, are those in the most vulnerable communities. But we also have to make sure that we bring communities with us on this too, because price promotions, if we took that forward, may also have an, an impact on those with the, the least money to spare. So we have to work together. We have to make sure that we have nothing off the table when we bring forward the consultation and work together to make sure that we have the impact that we all require, which is to see a, a downward trend on obesity levels in our country. Question number three, Gillian Martin. Thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it's taken to address health inequalities. Minister. Yeah, reducing health inequalities is one of the biggest challenges that we face. They are, they are a symptom of wider income inequalities, inequalities which are exacerbated by policies of austerity and welfare reform. We are taking action focusing on addressing the underlying causes, ending poverty, promoting fair wages, supporting families and improving our physical and social environments. Gillian Martin. Minister for that answer. The Minister notes that health inequalities are firmly linked to income inequalities. Can the Minister give an analysis of the potential knock-on effect to the, on the NHS that a predicted 10% increase in child poverty as a result of the UK Government's two-child policy will have? Minister. It, well, again, I will reiterate that the UK Government's welfare cuts are unfair and are having a hugely damaging and disproportionate impact on women. By 2021, around 50,000 households in Scotland will be affected by the two-child cap, reducing spending in Scotland by around 120 million. So while the Conservatives do come here very often ask us to do more on a number of different issues, perhaps they need to be also asking their UK government colleagues to stop with this gross unfairness. The IFS estimates that a three-child family will lose on average 2,500 per year, while families with four children more will lose 7,000 per year, and four million families right across the UK will see entitlements fall. Reducing support, support to low-income families will push people further into poverty, which impacts neg negatively on health and causes pressure on other public services. So, presiding officer, four million families impacted by harsh Tory cuts. I think that's four million reasons why we should not be voting Tory in June. Miles Briggs. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Has the Minister studied the new report published this week by the Mental Health Foundation, Surviving or Thriving, which highlights severe health inequalities within mental ill health in Scotland? What specific additional action is the Scottish Government taking to reduce health inequalities among people suffering from mental health challenges and illnesses? Minister. Again, I thank Miles Briggs for raising the issue. Again, I do think, though, that while he does talk about inequalities quite often in this chamber, that again he should be making these points also to his UK government colleagues who are the source of some of this inequality and have the power within themselves to try and reverse some of that inequality. The member will also have been in the chamber when my colleague Maureen Watt set forward our new 10-year health, mental health strategy, which does look at the impact of inequalities and has a range of actions that will help uh, reduce uh, inequalities and help reduce some of that impact that has, that detrimental impact that has on mental health. But again, I do reiterate, it takes a bit of a brass neck for the Conservatives to continually come here and talk about inequalities when they themselves have been the cause of much of that inequality in the society of the country. Neil Findlay. Does the Minister agree that uh, income inequality is at the heart of health inequality and one of the key ways of addressing that is through the tax system? Why won't the government introduce a progressive tax system? Minister. 
of measures within the powers that we have to make sure that we can reduce inequalities. We're taking forward a number of, a, a number of uh, measures around living wage. We're bringing forward, we've brought forward uh, plans around um, our uh, taxes system uh, as well. And we also continually mitigate against the worst impacts of welfare reform. So we're doing a number of different measures within the powers that we have, within the, uh, within the budget that we are, have been given, to make sure that we can do our best to make sure that we have and can create the, the fairer society thing that we all seek. And it just seems a bit of a pity at times that Neil Finlay continues to ignore those measures and continues to cart from the sidelines. Question number four, Dean Lockhart. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what it is doing to encourage participation in sport. Minister again. The Active Scotland's Outcomes Framework sets out our ambitions for a more active Scotland and is underpinned by a commitment to equality. We want to ensure that people of all ages from all communities across Scotland have the opportunity to participate in sport and physical activity. That is reflected in our investment in programmes such as Active Schools to provide more sport and physical activity opportunities for young people and also our investment in facilities including community sports hubs, of which there are currently 157 right across Scotland, increasing to 200 by 2020. I'm also delighted that following a total investment of 12 million, the superb facilities at the UK's first ever para sports centre at Inverclyde are now open. In Lockhart. I thank the Minister for that response. Despite increasing levels of child and adult obesity in Scotland, the budget for sports has been cut significantly <coughs> over the past two years, even after taking into account the funding mentioned by the Minister. Can the Minister therefore explain how cutting the budget for sports, including budgets for grassroots sports clubs, is going to he help tackle the increasing health problems associated with obesity and related challenges? Minister. I uh, announced uh, in April an additional two million investment in sports governing bodies which will be redistributed by Sports Scotland to help offset the reduced revenue from the National Lottery. I've also written uh, to the UK Government around the issues that continually pre present themselves around reduction in National Lottery. So again I look forward to maybe getting the member's support and asking his colleagues to do what they can to reverse the National Lottery uh, challenges that our sporting uh, bodies are, are facing. And also since uh, this government took uh, office, we have seen uh, an increase in investment in our infrastructure. We have some of the best infrastructure across the country in terms of sport. We've invested heavily around making sure young people get the opportunities. We've increased the, the way in which PE and fundamentally restructured the way in which PE uh, is being taken forward across our schools, seeing us now reaching around 98% of uh, our, ch our children meeting the two hour PE. Um, I hear, again, people carping from the sideline. These are, this is a significant investment this government has taken forward to improve the infrastructure of our sporting uh, arenas across the country. We have increased fundamentally the number of children who are taking part in two hours or more of PE in every school. We have increased, we're, uh, we've just opened a new parasports centre in Inverclyde, now open. We've hosted one of the best ever Commonwealth Games uh, in Glasgow. Our commitment uh, is uh, very strong to sport and giving all of our young people the opportunity they deserve. Again, though, this is exacerbated. Children's opportunity and life chances are exacerbated by inequalities. Again, I would just reiterate, the Conservatives need to be looking a little bit closer to home around inequalities and where that is being uh, manifested. Question five has not been lodged. Question six, Alison Harris. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what health guidance is given to operators of sports and leisure facilities that are close to the Grangemouth Chemical Complex. Minister. There are strict arrangements in place to ensure that the Grangemouth Chemical Complex operates safely and that if something does go wrong, that health and safety of the public is protected. These arrangements include a community warning system in the event of an incident at the complex which enables people living and working in nearby areas to be alerted quickly. The community warning system is tested <coughs> twice a year. Falkirk Council provides regular local guidance on what people should do when the community warning system is triggered. That advice, which applies to sports and leisure facilities, is to go in, stay in and tune in. That is to go indoors, close the doors and windows and wait for further instruction. Alison Harris. I thank the Minister for that response. However, during the recent incident at Ineos in Grangemouth, Provision was made for pupils at primary and secondary schools to be kept indoors. However, users of the outdoor sports pitches continued to use the facilities. So in view of the numbers of people who, are, who use these facilities, will the Scottish Government undertake to review the guidance given to the operators of these facilities? Minister. 
Yeah, um, I think the member raises a, a very uh, good point. Uh, of course, on the 2nd of May, there was that incident she described at Grangemouth where a limited number of staff were evacuated from the site following the gas leak uh, and the incident centred on the Keneal gas plant and involved the release of uh, gases uh, there. Uh, the local incident management plan was activated and local cordons and road closures were put in place to ensure public safety. However, the points that she makes are good ones. I'm happy to continue to be in dialogue with her on this and want to reassure that there will be a multi-agency debrief of the incident being held on Wednesday the 17th of May and that debrief will examine the events and ensure that any learning points are captured in order, order to refine and improve the off-site plan and arrangements and Scottish Government Resilience Division is leading this debrief process. I'll continue to keep her updated uh, uh, regarding the outcomes from that meeting. Question number seven, Bruce Crawford. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action is being taken to improve mental health services in the NHS Forth Valley area. Minister Maureen Watt. Thank you, Presiding Officer. We have published a new 10-year strategy for mental health in Scotland. The new strategy contains 40 actions, including those which commit to, fund, to funding improved provision for services to teach to treat child and adolescent mental health problems and funding work to improve provision of psychological therapy services and help meet set treatment targets. As part of these actions, we've announced a 54 million comprehensive package of support to improve access to mental health services for both CAMS and psychological therapies. Within this, we have established an improvement team within Healthcare Improvement Scotland to work on improving access to mental health services. Forth Valley are one of the first boards to work with the improvement team. Working with the board, a new service model has been introduced by NHS Forth Valley, and we have seen substantial improvements in CAMS weights. Forth Valley are to be congratulated on attaining the target, having recorded the lowest rate of performance across Scotland at this time last year. Bruce Crawford. I uh, thank the Minister for her reply. I recognise the improvements being made. Um, could the Minister please tell me what the current waiting times are for child and adolescent mental health services in the Forth Valley area? I have con constituents who continue to be concerned about the length of time it's taking for their children to access services. Can the Minister therefore please tell me what specific actions have already been taken and what more can be done to improve access to CAMS in the Forth Valley area? Minister. Um, the latest published figures for quarter four of 2016 show Forth Valley's performance against the standard improved across the second half of 2016 with 94.8% uh, of people treated within CAM services were seen within 18 weeks. This compares to 34% of people receiving treatment within CAM services with the 18-week standard in the same time uh, a year ago. Uh, in response to your constituents' concerns, uh, the member might wish to know that I met yesterday with parents from CAMS Forth Valley, uh, CAMS Forth Valley Parents Voices, and I welcome the opportunity to hear their experiences of CAMS and to discuss the, uh, the work that we are supporting through investment and the new mental health strategy to improve the standard of care from CAMS, uh, including the quality and continuity of service. At board level, the new service model has been introduced with NH within NHS Forth Valley. The new model looks to address delays identified in the system, as well as undertaking staff recruitment and working on the longer waits. I understand that the board has established a parents for forum to increase engagement with local families, and this will meet for the first time at the end of this month. And that's precisely what, as a government, we wish to see patient involvement and participation in designing services. Monica Lennon. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Bruce Crawford has raised an important issue. I met with the founder of the CAMS Fourth Valley Parent Voices Group, uh, Katie Sneddon, and other parents yesterday after their meeting with the Minister. And as the newspapers have reported today, um, they were in absolute tears as they were sharing their stories. It was heartbreaking to listen to the individual challenges they have had to face in trying to get the support they desperately need for their children. I welcome some progress has been made, but it's not simply just about waiting times. The Scottish Government have committed to look at rejected referrals, and I look forward to hearing more of the detail on this. But can the Minister provide an update 
on what her response is to the group's call for a full audit and review of the CAM service in the Force Valley and if she will give this consideration. Minister. Um, well, as I've already said, I, I did meet with uh, the parents yesterday and listened to their stories, some of which, most of which are historic, uh, uh, also pre-2007. So, as a result of uh, what we've got in the new mental health strategy and what has been uh, done so far, we are seeing excellent progress in Forth Valley on waiting times. So, Rather than have a full-blown audit of what's happening, I'd prefer to get on with doing the job and making sure that what is required uh, is put in place. And that's precisely what we're doing in Forth Valley and with the new mental health strategy across the country. Dean Lockhart. <coughs> Thank you. Despite the hard work of its dedicated staff, NHS Forth Valley continues to suffer from a lack of resource. This left over 300 people waiting over four months for treatment. Can I ask the Minister, when will Forth Valley NHS be in a position to meet government targets in this area? Minister. Well, as I've already mentioned in um, my previous answers, uh, Forth Valley, NHS Forth Valley, Valley is now meeting its waiting time targets and of course this government was the first to introduce uh, waiting times. The NHS Forth Valley uh, Scottish Government allocation for building capacity in Forth Valley was 233,409 in 2016-17 rising to 369,112 in 20. 17-18 and this um, uh, money is being reduced, uh, uh, used to reduce pressure on the core CAM services, increase provision of early intervention, education and community services, support group work uh, with a focus on tiers two and three capacity. Uh, it's also being used to fund uh, clinical posts in older people's services, MSc applied psychology in primary care and early psychological intervention practice support. A range of measures to make sure that Forth Valley meets its targets. Question number eight, Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government whether it will provide an update on progress with the analysis of responses to its recent consultation, organ and tissue donation and transplantation. Minister Aileen Campbell. The consultation responses are currently being independently analysed and we expect to receive that analysis very soon. We will carefully consider the analysis before setting out our next steps in the coming months. Bob Doris. Uh, I thank the Minister for that answer. Minister, I helped scrutinise evidence at stage one in the previous proposals for an opt-out organ donation system uh, before this Parliament. Our committee recommended additional specialist nurses, consultants and intensive care beds, irrespective of whether any opt-out system was to be introduced. I voted against the opt-out organ donation system, not out of principle, but because of the weakness of the legislation before us at that time. So, Minister, can I ask what consideration the Scottish Government has given to the recommendations I have referred to earlier on in my question, as well as addressing any weaknesses within the previous legislation? Minister. Um, thank you. Um, since the programme of work to increase donation rates as part of the, a donation and transplantation plan for Scotland 2013 to 20, the Scottish Government has provided funding to appoint seven additional specialist nurses for or, organ donation, as well as a dedicated regional manager for, from NHS Blood and Transplant to work full time in Scotland. There are currently 20 time, 22 full time equivalent nurses. Appointing more, however, would dilute, dilute the expertise in approaching families and obtaining authorisation and would not necessarily lead to a rise in donation rates. A review by the clinical leads for organ donation across Scotland resulted in resources being targeted at specific areas where it was felt we could make a real difference, for example, amongst ethnic minority groups and in rural areas. In addition, resources have been moved to where donation potential is greatest. And in terms of intensive care capacity, in 2015, National Services Division published Commissioning Transplantation to 2020, which looked at the capacity within the NHS to achieve this and was not highlighted as an issue. Um, again, though, we do have a very positive story. Although the, the stage one did not pass, there has been a, a huge amount of work and effort gone into ensuring that the uh, there is effort and attention placed on ensuring we can increase the rates of donation. We've got a good story to tell. The work has been considerable, but again, I can continue to keep in touch with Mr. Doris around the next steps following the analysis from the consultation. Question number nine, Mark Ruskell. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to address the effects of noise pollution on public health. 
Minister. Through Scotland's implementation of the European Commission Environmental Noise Directive, Directive 2002-49EC, noise mapping and associated action plans have been put in place to help manage environmental noise. The strategic noise maps are currently being updated by Jacobs, experts in this field, and are due for publication this summer. They will inform the implementation of the next set of action plans, which could include actions in areas such as traffic and transport policies, technological innovation and public <coughs> awareness raising. Mark Russell. Um, can I thank the Minister for that response? I mean, she'll obviously be aware that uh, noise is the second largest environmental cause of ill health after air pollution. In fact, a UK study showed uh, last year that exposure to noise above recommended levels resulted in, a, in an additional 1,169 causes of dementia, 788 cases of stroke, and 542 cases of heart attack in a single year. I mean, given this evidence, Minister, can I ask why Edinburgh Airport has recently been allowed to carry out a consultation into new flight paths, which will expose nearby communities to levels of up to 80 decibels without completing a full health impact study? Minister. Um, I will look into the issues that the member raises, but he is right to point out about the impact that noise can have on people's health. That's why the directive recognises that noise pollution is one of the main environmental problems in Europe and that a framework for noise management is necessary. And I'll continue to keep him uh, updated on the work that's ongoing around the mapping, uh, which uh, includes uh, planning exercises for the uh, four agglomerations, which includes Edinburgh. And that's a bit of work that's multidisciplinary and requires input from a range of local authority staff and other key partners. And it's proposed that the working groups for each area will be tasked with delivering content of the action plans and the Scottish Government will take responsibility for finalising and submitted, submitting completed plans. So I think the one that he will be particularly interested in will be the one for Edinburgh, which will include uh, the communities around uh, the airport. Alexander Burnett. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it is becoming clear that both noise and air pollution are becoming a systemic problem in Scotland. Will the Minister back my colleague Maurice Golden's campaign to increase the number of air quality monitors across Scotland? Minister. Well, again, I'll... Uh, keep the member updated on how the mapping exercise is uh, progressing uh, and certainly take a good look at the work that he indicates his colleagues uh, is taking forward. Again, like Mark Ruskell said, environmental noise is an important issue. It, is, it does have an impact on health. That's why we need to make sure that we have the right procedures and people in place and making sure that we have the right resources and uh, in place as well to ensure uh, enforcement and recognising the impact that it can have on our communities. Uh, again, that's why the directive is so important because it is one of the main environmental problems in Europe and that a framework for noise management is mm -hmm. necessary. And it also means that the Scottish Government will continue, require, will continue to maintain and protect enhancing environmental standards, even though they are an EU requirement. We'll do that and continue that post-Brexit. Question 10 has not been lodged. Question 11, Ben McPherson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what support it is giving to general practice. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robson. In October 2016, the First Minister made clear the scale of our ambition in shifting the focus of health investment from acute care to primary and community care, with an increase in overall annual funding for primary care of 500 million by 2021. Uh, and while the, the full 500 million invested in primary care should benefit general practice by 2021, Scottish Government investment in direct support of general practice will reach an additional 250 million per year. There will be a year-on-year -year increased investment between now and then. The investment has already started in 2016-17. Investment in direct support of general practice will be £60 million, and this will increase to £71 million in 17-18 in direct support of general practice. Ben McPherson. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Can the Cabinet Secretary also explain what support will be provided to practice staff in Edinburgh in particular? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I am aware uh, that the, the member has a, a particular interest in the, the issues surrounding Inverleith uh, medical practice uh, based with, within his constituency um, and the, the retention of the, the practice staff team within the NHS was one of the, the key considerations of NHS Lothian. I know he's taken a, a particular interest in this and has spoken uh, to me about this on a number of occasions. All of the staff have found alternative positions uh, within several other GP practices and all within the NHS, something which we have actively uh, promoted. 
More widely, the Edinburgh Health and Social Care Partnership are developing a, a programme of support for practices and their staff who are facing uh, some challenges and, of course, they, they're using the Scottish Government's Primary Care Transformation Fund to do that. Brian Whittle. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The Cabinet Secretary uh, will be aware that uh, the GP practice in Fenwick, Crosshouse and Comores have recently had to resign from the practice uh, with the potential of losing five GPs in the area and a further six through imminent retirement. On top of this, there are already 15 vacant places in Ayrshire and Arran as of two weeks ago. So what comfort can the Cabinet Secretary give to those GPs who have had to resign from their practices or are in danger of resigning their practice? Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, as I've said uh, in this chamber on a number of occasions, the, there are short and medium term uh, supports that are available uh, through boards to help to address some of the, the recruitment and retention challenges in the here and now. But the solution uh, that will help to transform uh, the position of general practice and primary care in Scotland is based around the new contract and the new model for primary care. And that is something that will benefit uh, GPs uh, within Ayrshire and Arran and elsewhere in Scotland. But I can say to, to Brian Whittle and Don, Donald Cameron, who earlier raised uh, these issues about GPs, what they're less uh, keen to talk about, though, and to quote, is the RCGP's uh, concerns expressed today that when they said that if uh, the 220 six GPs from other EU countries working in Scotland had to leave following Brexit. It could have grave consequences for patient safety. We don't hear the Tories quoting the RCGP on that very much. I wonder why. Question number 12, Gordon Lindhurst. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to improve public health through cycling. Minister Aileen Campbell. We know that cycling has both physical and mental health benefits and plays a big part in health improvement. Over the period 2014 to 17, Sports Scotland has invested almost 2.6 million into Scottish cycling, the governing body for the sport in Scotland. In addition, through Transport Scotland, we have increased investment in active travel by over 83% compared to 2013-14 and have pledged to match record levels of investment over the life of this parliament. All cycling organisations are working together to consider what more can be done to get people active through cycling at a national and local level. Gordon Lindhurst. Um, to, I thank the Minister for that answer. Um, does the Scottish Government agree with the eight calls set out in Pedal on Parliament's manifesto? And if not, which ones does it not agree with? Minister. We will certainly continue to work with all of our partners around the issues that we can do to make improvements around the accessibility, safety uh, of uh, cycling at a local and at a national level. We do have and have uh, invested heavily in making sure that there is more accessibility around cycling. We've invested through legacy programmes. The one that he may be interested in is Alolian's MSP is the recently opened Skelf Bike Park in Edinburgh, uh, which um, has been... Uh, Grant, had got grant funding made available through the uh, legacy project and which is allowing people who might not ordinarily have had access to, to cycling to be able to use the, the cycle route there free of charge for many years to come. We also have um, invested uh, over, with our, including with our partners, a total investment in cycling facilities of approximately 138 million since uh, 2007. We've also increased the number, and, uh, number of cycle paths and walking lanes. And so we'll continue to work with and listen to all calls about what more we can do to increase uh, cycling participation levels at that local and national level. And again, we'll work with Pedal in Scotland uh, to identify areas that we can work together to make improvements for Scotland. Ben McPherson. Thank you, President Officer. Can I ask the Minister what impact does the Scottish Government envisage that the decision to leave the European Union could have in terms of funding for the future of active travel hubs across Scotland? Minister. Well, we have pledged to match uh, record levels of investment in active travel, as I said, over the life of this Parliament. Transport Scotland, as the lead partner, has secured funding of up to £8 million investment from the European Regional Development Fund 2014-2020 programme to support the development of low-carbon travel and transport hubs until December next year. In June, Transport Scotland will publish details of projects which have been successful under the initial low-carbon travel and transport challenge 
fund round. All ERDF contracts entered into before the UK leaves the UK will be guaranteed, even when those payments continue beyond the EU exit point. However, there is no clarity in what that replacement funding arrangements will be for those schemes once the UK has left the EU. The Scottish Government will negotiate with the UK Government to ensure that future financial support for the range of initiatives currently supported by European funds is allocated on a fair and equitable basis across the UK post-Brexit. But I think the Member is right to recognise that in all areas of life, the, the mess that the UK Government has got us in with Brexit, that the lack of clarity, the lack of engagement they've had, it does impact upon uh, many issues in, in local communities, such as cycling. So uh, we'll continue to negotiate, we'll continue to make the case, uh, but, and we'll continue to uh, ensure that Scotland gets a fair deal in these negotiations. Question 13, Polly McNeill. To ask the Scottish Government what its policy is on the provision of minor injuries units in communities. Cabinet Secretary. The planning and provision of local services is the responsibility of NHS boards. This planning should take account of local needs to ensure that demands are met and patient care is delivered in an optimal way. Presiding officer, the West Glasgow Minor Injuries Unit treats adults and children aged five and over. Um, on the 13th of December, Greater Glasgow Health Board announced that that service was temporarily moving to the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. Um, I'm sure the Minister would agree that minor injuries units are a really important service to prevent patients turning up at accident and emergency services and therefore reducing pressure on accident and emergency. Uh, people who live in the west of Glasgow would like an assurance that that service will return as before as it was a temporary measure and really it's important that minor injuries units are also local services. Uh, does the Minister hold the view that the people of the west of Glasgow should have their minor injuries unit returned to them as promised? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I first of all agree with Polly McNeill that minor injuries units are a very important service and of course as she says can reduce uh, pressure on uh, A&E departments and provide ease of access uh, to, to patients. Uh, as Polly McNeill I'm sure will be aware the York Hill unit was always uh, an interim step as part of the migration of services in, in Glasgow uh, in recent years and it's right that the board should take the time to properly consider where the new West Glasgow service should be located. She will understand some of the challenges with the York Hill site which I think was partly the, the reason for some of the low attendances it was not a site that was easy to access so I would hope that Polly McNeill would welcome the fact that there has been an assurance not least from the chair of the board to me directly that there will be a West Glasgow minor injuries unit however I think it is right that they look at other locations the Gart Naval site being one of them and I'm sure she would understand uh, Polly McNeill would understand that there are some advantages uh, to that site in terms of the co-location with other services so I would encourage her to engage with the board directly there is no question about whether there uh, should uh, be a West of Scotland Minder Injuries Unit. There will be one. It is about where that is best located. Thank you. And that concludes portfolio questions.